welcome everyone. Um, as you, if you're a regular watcher, listener of the webinars, we try to cover a lot of different subjects in relation to BIM. Uh, today, super excited because we've got a real life BIM superhero <laughs> and a very modest one as well. well. We'll come to that. Josh has joined us. We'll be talking about BIM execution planning and how to implement BIM on projects and uh, on big projects, on small projects, on many different types of projects. We, we really appreciate your time and um, we'll get, we'll get right into it. We will also have time for Q and A that we'll answer through the chat, and we hope to also add a demonstration at the end of this. So in 30 minutes, we've got a lot to cover. Um, let's get started. So I mentioned a real life superhero. When it comes to BIM, this is a new wave still, even though it's been going for 20 years or so. Yeah. Um, but Josh has been in the mix for how long now? Well, I've been in the AEC industry, if you count my uh, time as a CAD operator, 18 years? 18 years, so nearly 20 years yeah. being in a relation to, to BIM. It's crazy to do that math. And they said, so <laughs> is it 10,000 hours that you have to... Something like that. So I, I, I started in, in AEC doing CAD operating at a civil engineering firm for a little while, um, and then eventually kind of off and on, and then got into um, project engineering somewhere around 2002, and then about 2006, 2007, I started focusing on BIM and the DEC. So, so you transitioned from doing, using CAD, and learning and doing, using BIM tools, and now there's a new wave of people that you're helping to get up to speed and use these tools in their daily routine? Absolutely, that, yeah. yeah. So. I've transitioned from doing the technical work to leading and, and coaching a team in that. What drives you? What was the primary driver? Is it the technology? Is it the helping people? Is it the whatever's new? Is it, you know, what, what are the, what drives Josh? What's the... It's, it's changed over time. It's definitely changed over time. I think at first, um, you know, I was really, well, I, you know, I started in operations as a PD. I don't think I'll ever forget it because I was sitting there. And I can remember where I was, where I was in the room, what the project looked like. This is your first experience of BIM? My first visual okay. look of BIM, and it was a construction, a 4D construction sequence. And I was watching, you know, little animated trucks like pull up and, you know, parts of the building going up. And I was like, oh my God, that is, that is what I need to be doing. So, so that, that was um, the initial reaction was all. Man, that is that is cool. That is potentially valuable, but maybe like how to apply it. And, and I wanted you, to be the person that was behind that. Okay, the, so at creating time, this as a solution. I've always been a builder at heart, like an engineer type person. So I'm problem solving, or you know, I can visualize things in three D. And what I've learned over time is that not everybody can do that. We all have different strengths, right? So. Right. Some of us can look at a set of drawings and look at something and look at a room and, and sort of visualize what that might look with changes to it or, you know, something being built that wasn't there before kind of thing. And others have different strengths, right? And that visual just took, you know, the construction and you didn't need an explanation. Right. And so one of the things that was, was fun is that I'd have people come up to me and say, I've got this crazy idea I want to show you know, this, that, and the other thing I want to, you know, this is what I want to present to the clients, how I want to do it, we want to fly around, and do, do all this crazy stuff. And I would be like, well, I don't know how to do that, but let's, yeah, we'll figure it out, you know. Right. And that was, that was the fun of it for, for a while. We did all kinds of stuff. I mean, I remember doing a 4D sequence in like 2007 of an entire hospital. Mm -hmm. um, we did a, a, a flight through rendering of that hospital. <laughs> well with all the logistics information and it's a whole bunch of stuff that was you know not really happening a lot at that time. When you categorize those early BIM uses, those early deliverables through whatever process and tools tool set you used, what were the starting BIM uses and how did they transition through to maybe not today but just in those early time and in those early period twenty years ago nearly how how many of those were just for show, 
versus practical? Because you, you mentioned there some of these early ones that you started on were actually, it sounds very practical. <laughs> I th you know, I think did. they were pretty practical. Yeah. I mean, I you know you hear that term Hollywood bin. I know you've used that many times. <laughs> um, and I you know I feel like we were we were doing a little bit of that, but it wasn't like create the pretty picture, throw it away, go get the job. Right. So you know I did just I did a lot of little random stuff, like we would do a crane study and figure out where the crane would be to go through the building, and I would draw the K rails and the bolts and like you know get really down to literally the nuts and bolts of things yeah. in a lot of cases. Um, okay, so, so why? Um, why and how? So when you when you look at how you've implemented BIM over the years, even when it wasn't mainstream, why do you think that you have been able to make it valuable, make it practical? What are the things that you've done that help others to actually use it rather than ignore it and think it's a marketing thing or um, see it as a parallel process what have you done what are, what are the differences what what are the pieces of magic that we can share with others that are creating these deliverables and maybe not getting the same sort of reaction or results yeah what are the yeah well I mean it, I think it comes down to understanding not just the value for you as a general contractor but being able to communicate if I do this, your project is better. And I think that one of the things that I always try to, I don't know if I was coming across, but I, I inherently always have the owner's best interest in, in mind. I'm not trying to do, I'm not trying to bring technology to a project just for the sake of using technology. I'm looking for what's going to provide value. And I think if you have that mindset that, how can I use this tool to provide value to the project team, the design team, the owner, approach me with that value in mind and say, here's what's in it for you, mm -hmm. and letting them know that, you know, I'm not just about the technology, I'm about helping you. Not doing it for show, not doing, doing it just because it's new, right. not because we you know, can, it's because there's a reason. And, and so, and the beauty of it is we do get to do new stuff. We it's new, that. it's so, cool, yeah, it's a, it's a byproduct. There's some exciting yeah. stuff in that, that you do get to do new stuff. So, so there's like five questions going on in my head <laughs> at the moment. Um, some of them come to the the culture and the failing fast, continuous improvement, that side of things. I think that's more kind of corporate conversation. I'd love yeah. to hear more about how you have seen that progress through the different organizations. And But that's let's shelve that question for a second. Um, you were talking around value and talking around use of whatever that deliverable is and defining something that somebody else is going to get value from. How, how do you define what value would be, who, who is the customer, and how do you target that? Well, we start is, what are the risks on the project? What are you concerned about with this project? Because if you start with that and say, well, we have this risk, mm -hmm. It's pretty apparent on every project, or maybe it's a new list. Something that the yeah, owner is really you know, concerned about. Right, which, you know, I mean, let's be honest, a lot of times they're concerned about the same Some stuff, of the same things. Similar things. Yep. Um, so we're talking about project budget, project schedule, safety, quality. quality. Yeah, yeah, the four, the big four. Things. So if you go, hey, you know, I can, um, you know, one, we're going to get, you know, savvy subs. You've already got a great architect on board. They're designing in this platform, by the way, I can take that information, I can combine it with my subs information, and now we can get an even better coordinated design. Yes, it's going to take some time, mm -hmm. uh, but it's part of the way I do business, and here's the benefits you're going to see out of it. I'm trying to mitigate as many of those risks that we've identified as early as possible, then there's value. And you start talking like that with a client, I mean, it's, it's right. pretty clear to them. And you talked about uh, building it virtually. Yeah, so the whole yeah. the early term of VEC, virtual design and construction, of being able to virtually prototype a building, whereas previously only industries that were making objects that were small could prototype something and we do it all many of the same thing. Yeah. And, and so now we are able to do that, but it's to what degree, and that conversation is based on which risks are more prevalent, which risks are more uh, 
valuable to solve or to mitigate for the customer that you have that conversation. And the resources that we have is how how you get subcontractors to follow that if it's not part of the contract. Like how how do you get them to you know yeah. commit to something that they're not really contracted for? Well, my first question would be why is it not part of the contract? Right. Right. <laughs> That's, I mean, that's hands down. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We're, I mean, I work for a general contractor. Like that's what we do. Is we make contracts for people to do work. So, if that's a problem, we should be going to the root of it and saying, "Why is it in your contract?" Right. And so that's that's to, you know, I talked about us, you know, revamping our our, our our templates and whatnot. When we started that six or so years ago, when when we, we had some stuff. One of the things we didn't have was a contract exhibit. And I said, we need one of those. And so a small team of us got together and said, well, we, we sort of started with that question. Well, what do we do if it's not part of the contract? Well, let's make it part of the contract. <laughs> and so we came up with a BIM requirements you know, exhibit that would be added to the contract. And we might have a BIM execution plan, it's the relationship between this contract exhibit and that BIM execution plan. Mm -hmm. um, typically intended to be a living document, so there's some sort of uh, language gymnastics to, to, to write that in. Um, it was a little beyond me, but we got it done. Um, and then, you know, some basic stuff that I would I would suggest to anybody to include in something like that is what are your basic requirements for engaging your trade partners or your design partners, especially in the design build situation, um, in that process. So what, from a fundamental standpoint, do you need your partners to do, engage in meetings, uh, you know, coordinate their own work, ensure that the procurement of models and coordination of models doesn't necessarily impact negatively this overall schedule of materials and deliveries and things like that. So you're sort of saying, engage in this process, but you need to make sure that the downstream effects of what we're doing here on your particular work are managed. Right? So, so Josh's answer to that, when somebody's having a struggle with implementing their BIM execution plan, is let's take the things that are standard on most projects and put them into the other contracts, the day-to-day -day contracts, so that if there are there's language about um, basic responsibilities, yeah, and then anything that's project specific, so the LOD stuff doesn't go in those main contracts, right? That's something that's later, and that's part of the BIM execution plan, right? So in but, essence, your BIM execution plan can become an attachment, right? At some point, but you also said you have to include some. Um, to get the words that you used there with, with the some decent language around the fact that it's archived and live. There's there's like this BIM execution plan that obviously has to be attached somewhere, but it also develops over time right. as more and more people collaborate and get involved. So so we've we've had different ways of dealing with that in the in the past. Um, I think the best method right now that um, makes it more official is that you have that exhibit in there that says, hey, well, this is what we're going to do. And then when you sign that agreement to say, here's our execution plan, and everybody's agreed to it, you do a no-cost change order, and that becomes part of it. Right. That's, that's, that's the best <coughs> So there's a, there's a workflow of best practice to enable people to actually agree to some early terms, and then agree to the fact that there will be some more, but they will be more project-specific, and when they are ready, they get. The, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's it's. We, we want to have that in there in the beginning when we start the procurement process, so that we can start having those conversations about what is the BIM scope, what are we doing with it, what are those BIM uses. Um, you know, we we're trying to get away from just having a line item of it, right? Right, because that is undefined. You wouldn't just say, "Well, I'm going to build you a building." And so, to me, it seems absurd that we say, "Well, we're we going to do BIM." I got BIM. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, to me, that's as, as broad as saying, "Well, yeah, I'm going to do the steel." 
you know, or I'm gonna, I got your design for it. You know, it's 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 so so broad. So to, to talk about that from a corporate perspective, um, I, I know um, there are different types of companies out there, and some of them have dedicated resources for this, and some of them have a person that has this attached to their day job. Some of them have departments for this, and I know that there's an innovation team. Yeah, is that has that always been the case? Yeah, it's what well, I mean. Um, I've seen different approaches to it. There's sort of like the volunteer committees where you know you may not even have anybody that's a dedicated them or DVC resource. You have other companies that there's an entire department dedicated to it, and it's not really part of anybody's job. Um, there's other um, approaches where you know it, it might be a mix where you've got a small team and then you, you, know, you're, you have a few minimal workforce and that's mm -hmm. that's more or less our approach is that um, and we're, we're, we're I would say we're rebalancing constantly with you know how much do we uh, expect our project teams to do versus how much do we have dedicated resources mm -hmm. so, so you've seen it from where BIM started to become a thing, and there was the requirement for a BIM guy. That BIM guy became overworked, and therefore there was a need for more than one, and that became this BIM department. And and now, in order to get real benefit, you're saying that, because there's this drive to dissolve that. It, it, BIM should not be an additional thing. You know, this is not... Is this a BIM project or is it not? This is just we're doing we're not BIM BIM coordination. We're we're doing design coordination. Right. So how do you make it a natural everyday thing? It's to almost to remove the BIM titles. Being able to make it part of everyone's day job still requires some kind of support team. I'm hearing that if you don't have that innovation team to take ideas from the masses and take them to that next level. Unfortunately, a lot of the teams that I'm sure are you know, on this webinar are having to do that themselves. The, the BIM manager, that's going to be a labeling and has a great idea or sees some yes. new technology and they take it on themselves to almost prove the value within a project that maybe they're working on that's midstream or it's the unfortunate nature of being of not having an innovation team to be able to do that to be able to vet things take it to the next level and then when it's got to that next level implement for value it's it's kind of that investigation phase that i think you guys have that opportunity to have a much better structure to implement is there do you see that as a is a difference and advantage of, of how you're structured, or I, th I think it is. I mean, I think it's a good way to do it to have people, you know, small team dedicated to vetting out that innovation. I mean, mm -hmm. that's kind of what we're known for is having a culture of innovation. So um, it would probably seem weird to people if we didn't have that. Yeah. Um, do you have any struggles? Like, do, do people sometimes try to do mini projects on their own, or is it so well ingrained and such a good structure that you know? I think it has to be maintained. You know, you have to maintain that, hey, this is how you do it. Sometimes you, you know, change the system um, out of necessity and you have to re you have to constantly communicate because there's you know, a lot of, as you grow, there's a lot of new people coming in. So you've got to say, hey, if you've got an idea, this is what you should do. Right. Um, so I think our, I, I like our approach to say, okay, if I've got an idea, I can, I can bring it up and I'll figure it out and, and we can, um, you know, move forward with it. So, um, I've heard of a couple. I, I would imagine that without that, it would be a little bit of a, more of a struggle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, early on in, in my days, um, I wasn't looking at trying to pilot things like Doxel and AI and you know, these big things that we're, folks are trying to look at now. It was more like we got to figure out how to model this on this project so that I can have the steel to work. You know, so. That wasn't as much of a you know, uh, bite to chew off. That was more of a, hey, we got a problem to solve. Let's, let's solve it. There wasn't any question about so whether that, or not to do it. And that, that's interesting. That's a problem first. 
And so your implementation is problem first rather than being, this is some cool technology and what do we, how do we solve problems with it? I mean, don't get me wrong. I like technology. Then, right, right, right. I like the shiny objects. I yeah. like the gadgets and, and stuff like that. Um, but if you're not having a problem in so mind, so then why implement the technology? It's, <laughs> it's really, you know, what we should be asking ourselves. Um, and, and, you know, when, when, when stuff flops sometimes, that's what might be the case that you sort of try to fit a technology and sort of find it, find a problem for a technology. And, you know, we see this all the time with some of the some startups that, hey, I got this cool tool, you know, this and that. Like, What's it for? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> well, right. okay. Like, are you designing this for construction? I don't know. You, you know, stuff like that. So, um, I think you have to come from a place of, we have this challenge, right. let's solve it. Um, Not just, we've got some cool AR, VR, AI, machine learning technology, how do you solve the problem with it? At the same time, I think there's there's a place for that, because that is... But that's your that's the inside of stuff. your innovation team most, most of the time. If there was a set of technology... I would say not so much. I, I okay. would say that our innovation team, part of what they try to do, and I think they do very, very well, is they look at what problem are you trying to solve? So they start there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, um, and we will, they help teams look at, um, or, or individuals look at, you know, what, what else is available? Are you just not aware that there's of other things available? LOD to planner? Are you just not aware of construction site or whatever to say, you know, okay, yes, you have this problem, but do you know that there's a solution to it? In some cases, that's just someone not being aware of a tool that already exists. In others, we may need to create something, or we may need to you know, get people that otherwise wouldn't be together together to collaborate on something. Um, that, that's a really like interesting that. point. So sometimes somebody would have a problem and try and go out and search for a solution, but whereas that, that solution might already be known to the team. Right. So you have an innovation team that understands all of these different products that might solve some of those. They're trying to keep up with it just like all of us, right? So it's not, you know. They, they need to read the ultimate BIM software list. <laughs> they do. It's a good list. Yeah, absolutely. So so what's what's kind of funny is we've been uh, just ad-libbing. Um, I haven't looked at my questions yet. So <laughs> let's talk successes. What are some of your, or just maybe one, major achievement for you throughout that nearly 20 year period, what would be a highlight, something that you would be um, proud to tell your family about, so for example? Yeah, what, what's a, I, well, I think one thing was, um, I could think of two good ones. One's more of a journey that started a couple years ago, mm -hmm. um, that actually you're familiar with because you were there, um, where I got, I, I sort of threw myself into the speaking circuit and, um, Rather than just kind of dip my toe in the water, I just kind of jumped in head first uh, in 2015 and decided to, to chair an entire conference or at least one day of it. So, um, which you know, was fantastic. <laughs> so since then, thank you. So since then, you know. So, so your your advice is: don't dip your toe in the water. <laughs> Nominate yourself to chair a conference. I, I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not advising anyone do what I do necessarily. Um, I just knew that I needed to, uh, there would there'd be value in, in, in doing those kind of things. And, and really what I was thinking at the time was, this is not part of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I need to get out there and, 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 and speak to people and, and not be the guy in the corner doing the, the fancy you know, thin stuff. And the other thing I, I, I think of that I, I sort of look at as a, as an achievement is, um, Winning an, an award from Thea Tech. So mm -hmm. in, in early 2018, I won some, a couple awards. One from well, DPI, I won a couple awards, but it was work that, that me and my team did. So we got one from Construct Tech Magazine on innovating. It was, it was really all the, based on the same work. Mm -hmm. um, it's just kind of cheating, maybe, that we got two awards <laughs> for the same work. But, um, you know, the big one was the, was the Thea Tech CD Award, which, if memory serves, it's the Celebration of engineering and technology innovation, or something like that. 
And so, you know, getting getting that in a large contractor category um, was was pretty big because they were recognizing that you know not only were we implementing something. So you were influencing standards bodies and influencing. Oh, and the great part there. about that is that that's just part of it. So what we did, what we won awards on, mm -hmm. is really just part of it. We really just we replaced one method with a better method. Um, and what the industry is realizing is that the standards need to be tweaked or changed to leverage the full power of that technology. <coughs> so it's a, it's a very big shift that a lot of people are trying to figure out what this mm -hmm. looks like. Um, for us, when we first started doing that, that scanning workflow, um, it was like, well, yeah, we want to replace this, but I want to figure out a way to produce a better product at the end of the day without rework. Right? Right. That's... You know, we want to talk about value. Let's let's reduce rework. Let's reduce errors. Let's improve quality. So you want at the earliest point possible when it's easy to do that. So that that became an experiment in scanning coffee while it's still wet. So so this is yeah that. this is the 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 actual um, solution that you're talking about. First of all, it was how do we more accurately measure, more quickly measure, but just that's it at the same point in time as we used to. And then it was how do we do that so much sooner that we can provide almost instantaneous feedback that means right. that that crew doesn't have to come back again right. and re-level the floor after it being whatever it turned out. Exactly. You know. Nobody wants, a, wants the budget for rework. Right. So if we can prevent that. And that was actually previously not labeled as rework. It was just part of the workflow. Right. Yeah, yeah, but so technically, so it, technically it it's rework. Like you, yeah. might have a, you might have a because budget in there for grinding and patching. Right. You just didn't have the accuracy, yeah, yeah. And, and so now you're looking at, well, the beauty of it too is like we can scan it and we can figure out, well, what is it, what was it when we when we finished it? Mm -hmm. And then you can, you know, work in, if you plan ahead, you can work in scans after that to figure out what's the building doing as you're building more of that building, yeah. right? And so That's now right. you can inform all kinds of different things. So you can, you know, monitor the concrete and the camera and, you know, mm -hmm. Stuff and, and and be able to tell really the effectiveness of uh, your, your your engineering that happened really early. You know, did we um, or you may be able to find errors in what your contractor did or whatever. So there's a lot of different uses for that. So. Very cool. So while I'm looking for my next question, what's your favorite construction joke? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't. Favorite construction joke? Oh my God, I can't even think of one. <laughs> I can't. You usually don't get a construction joke. It's just the There's always like a construction workers telling bad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I'm, I'm, you stumped me with that one. I don't know, I can't think of one. Louis chiming in. You got a construction joke? I know. No. no. <laughs> We're terrible. Okay, so there's a bunch of questions that I have on here that um, are really boring and I'm pleased that we didn't get time for. Let's, um, <laughs> let's just ask Josh if he's got any closing thoughts and then we will cut to a brief demonstration because I know that we're way over time. Um, yeah, we're running out of time. Running out, so. <laughs> running out of time, okay. Um, Josh, any final closing thoughts? Anything that you would like to share with the audience knowing that there are a set of design and construction professionals around the world that are trying to implement them they want to learn about and they have a real life superhero <laughs> to I, share I, with you i would say no matter uh no matter where you are in your bim journey as, as some like to call it um you know whether you're just starting or you're wondering are we getting the value out of this or you know you like dpr you've been you know, doing it for a long time and now you're trying to um, up your game. Um, I, I think it's it's a very exciting time. There's lots of different tools uh, available. So um, I think I would say don't get overwhelmed by how much stuff there is out there. Um, you know, focus on providing value to your clients, things like that, and, and what's gonna what's gonna benefit you. Start small, you know, um, if it's early. And then, um, you know, invest in your people. I think that's a huge thing that, um, 
you know, we have to we have to make sure that that, that, that people are are supported, not just from a you know, technical standpoint, but um, in everything they do. And I think that's if we lose sight of our business being, you know, uh, people centric and, and service based, then we will lose. Very very cool. Thank you very much for sharing. Let's um let, let's take a. Are you going to pull that and we're going to go over to a room? Yep. Okay, so we'll see you in a second.